Hey, TC3, my name is Chris. And my name is Josephine. And here's what's happening in this week's TC3 News. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram by searching TC3 Church to stay up to date and connected with everything going on here. You can also find us on YouTube. Our channel is youtube.com slash TC3 Church. You will find all of our services on demand there, as well as content channels for our TC3 kids, TC3 students, and TC3 live worship ministries. Subscribe to those channels today. Did you know that you can follow along with our Sunday message on the YouVersion Bible app? To get started, just head to tc3.church slash message. Or if you already have the YouVersion Bible app, you can find us in the app by tapping more, then events, and search for TC3 Church. YouVersion exists to help you read, hear, and explore the Word of God. So download the app right now. Hey, TC3, this summer from July 18 to the 23rd, we are excited to be heading to Denver, Colorado to serve at the Denver Dream Center for our summer missions trip. Now, if you've been looking for an opportunity to serve, this trip is perfect for you. If you want to be pushed outside of your comfort zone and see Jesus transform lives while impacting yours, this is for you. At the Dream Center, we'll be serving in a variety of ways, from neighborhood block parties, food pantries, street evangelism in downtown Denver, this trip has everything. Now, we don't want you to miss out on this incredible opportunity, so head to tc3.church slash Denver for more information and to get registered today. We want to thank our regular attendants who are taking advantage of PushPay, the fast, easy, and secure way to give. If you have not heard about PushPay, check out this video that will demonstrate how easy it is. will be hosting a child dedication service on Sunday, May 15th at 6 p.m. This is an opportunity for parents to publicly declare their intent to raise their child in a way that honors God and also give the child an opportunity to eventually have a personal relationship with Jesus. If you would like to participate, please email Pastor Andy at andy at tc3.church. Here at TC3, we're all about connecting people to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And we hope and pray that in today's experience, you connect with Jesus in a real way.
everybody welcome to church so glad to be with you all my name is Jim and I want to welcome especially our guests people checking us out for the first time thank you for trusting in us thank you for maybe driving by the building and saying you know what I think God wants to take me there maybe you listen to somebody who said maybe you should come to church and check us out either way we are glad that you are here in the house online wherever you may be and we have our ushers that are standing by and they have they're gonna come down the aisle with some information cards if you want one of those to get plugged in to the life of the church just kind of wave at them kind of sneak your hand up whatever you want to do take that card fill it out turn it into the information desk out in the lobby there you can drop it right in one of those buckets there but we want to get you plugged into the life of the church we want to be able to pray for you and let you know all the amazing events that we have going on right here at TC3 this is community this is a community that we're trying to build here and Ephesians 2:19 says that right you are no longer foreigners, you are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, members of his household. It's about community. That's what we're trying to create here, a community that believes in the power of Jesus Christ. And speaking of community, if you are new and you want to get to know, hey, how can I get more involved in the church and find out more about the church today, today, the starting point growth track starts at 10, uh, it's 1030 a.m. right next door in the adult ed room. If you're like, hey, I want to get to know this church and get plugged in more, a four week class just for you, 1030 right next door. If you want to know where to find that, you can find Avery, Avery, what, she's Avery, if you find Avery, she'll be at the information desk. There she is in the back. I knew I saw her. Or a team member, and they can help to kind of guide you the way and show you how to get there. I'm excited today to, uh, we're going to have a special guest here today, Joel Mom. You know, Joel Mom, he's a great speaker, author, pastor. We've had him here multiple times. Joel is a great speaker, always have amazing messages. We're excited to welcome in, him in today. He's also gonna have some information, some books for sale in the lobby, so be sure that you stop by and check that out and say hello. And most importantly, like let's welcome him into the house when we have him up here uh, later to, uh, after the, the worship here. All right, so we're getting ready to go into another form of worship, and that's, that's our offering and our giving. And we like a cheerful giver, and God wants us a no pressure moment, but to support the ministries that we have going on here. And you can participate by texting the number 77977. You can put the amount you want to give in the text box in TC3. You can also automate it. You can scan that QR code. We automate what's important. Will you pray with me here this morning? Lord Jesus, we invite you into this house 
We invite you into the worship, into this message. Lord, help us to just clear out the world, what's going on in our lives, our to-do lists, everything, and just focus on you. Focus on you with our worship, with our listening here. Lord, we want to lift up prayers that are in this house. We want to lift this offering up to you, Jesus. We know, we know you're going to multiply it. You're going to triple it. You're going to do amazing things with it. And Lord, we invite you into it all. Amen. Love to invite you guys to stand back with us as we continue in worship. Come on. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, when sorrow comes to steal. Joy, I own. When brokenness and pain is all I know, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. What? My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Chance when I stand in your love. Yeah. 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 Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not captive to the lies. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I Shaking, no, I won't be shaking. Yeah, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand. Yeah. 
Awesome. Hey, good morning. How is everybody? Man, that song was amazing. Our deliverer will see us through. One of my favorite verses comes from Isaiah, and it says, Strengthen the feeble arms, steady the feeble, or strengthen the weak arms, steady the feeble knees, and say to those with anxious hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God, He will come. He will come and save you. And the eyes of the blind will be open, and the ears of the deaf will hear. It says, The tongue of the mute will shout for joy. And it says, the lame will leap like deer, and there will be streams in the desert. And Paul says, we don't lose heart. Outwardly, we're wasting away, but inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is, un- on, but on what is unseen. Because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. If you're here this morning, you're feeling a lot of weight of the world. You spent too much time watching the news this week. Let me tell you something. Our deliverer is still on the throne. And you can be confident that he will come and he will come and save us. So we are confident in that. Amen? Well, I'm Joel. And uh, for some of you, they're like, oh, it's him again? That guy again. But for some of you, you're like, who is this guy? Um, I've, I've been here several times now. And I'm super excited this time. Pastor Gordon is going to give me four Sundays in a row. So, yeah, so hopefully, um, hopefully after this week, we don't see the attendance start dropping off, right? I might never get an invite back. So uh, next week, bring your friends. But uh, we're going to be talking about a new book that I'm working on. As, as some of you know, I write books and I speak about those books. And then I'm also a teaching pastor at my church in Texas. And um, I'm a Texan, live in San Antonio. And, uh, you know, I love coming to Florida because I feel like I feel like Texans and Floridians kind of have a common bond. They've kind of got this attitude about them. You know what I'm talking about? In fact, I heard a story about a guy from Florida, and he was in a a small plane with a British guy and a French guy, and they were flying over the Amazon, and they had to make an emergency landing, and they ended up landing right in a tribe of cannibals. And they landed, and the whole tribe comes around them, and the chief comes out, and he says, guys, I'm sorry, but we have a rule that anybody that comes into our village unannounced we kill you and we cut you up and use your skin for our canoes. And, uh, you know, the guys are horrified by this thought. Like, that's disgusting. Like, using our skin for canoes. And they said, but well, look, we're civilized headhunters. Um, we'll, we'll let you decide how you're going to die. So the British guy's up first and they say, how do you want to die? And he says, I want to die by the, the pistol. So they give him a pistol and he says, long live the queen. He dies and they start stripping his body down and wrapping it around a canoe and The Floridian is just terrified by this. He's like, what in the world? The French person's up next. They say, how do you want to die? And the Floridian says, I want to die by the sword. So they give him a sword and he says, vive la France. And, you know, he dies and they start stripping his body down, using it for a canoe. And the Floridian, they're like, all right, it's your turn. And he goes, I need a fork. He said, a fork? So somebody brings him a fork and he goes, you ain't going to make a canoe out of me. That's that rebellious Floridian, right? (laughs) So we're going to be talking over the next few weeks. It's May and June. This is Mother's Day and Father's Day are coming up. And we're going to be talking over the next few weeks about how to relate to our parents. Because here's what I know. Every one of us in here, we've got what you would call an interesting relationship with at least one parent. For some of you, it's your father, and some of you, the reason you live in Florida and they live in Washington is because of that interesting relationship. You're like, we'll just stay as far away from them and love them at a distance. Some of y'all, you know, you've got the, the, the parents that are just crazy, and you're trying to figure out, how do I honor my parents when they're crazy? Some of you, it's your in-laws. You're just like, they're crazy. And you know it. We've all got an interesting, complicated relationship with our parents. And some of us, man, we all love our parents. I mean, you just, we love our mom, but we know there's certain things you don't talk to mom about, certain things you don't talk to dad about. But in the middle of this, God calls us to honor our parents. And we're going to be doing a series over the next four weeks that I call Free Your Father. And I'll explain what that title means shortly. But it's basically about the idea that all of us had an imprint left on us by our parents and it can have a way of affecting everything we, we do. It can affect the way we lead others. 
It affects the way we lead our families. It affects how we feel about ourselves. And what we're going to talk about today is the fact that it even affects how you see God. And oftentimes, we get a bad idea of who God is because of something we witnessed in our parents growing up. So I'm going to tell a, a quick story. Uh, when I was growing up in middle school and high school, my family lived in Guatemala, in Guatemala, Central America. We were missionaries. We were from Texas, and Guatemala is about 1,800 miles from where we lived in Texas. And my dad, one, one summer, we decided we were going to drive our old blue Suburban up through Mexico and back to the Texas border to go home and visit my grandparents. So dad was getting the, the Suburban ready to go, and he commented that he was going to replace the tires when we got back to the U.S. And I remember thinking in my little 13-year-old mind, wait a second, we've got bad tires, so we're going to drive 1,800 miles to go get them replaced? That doesn't make sense. And I said that to my dad, and he's like, ah, it'll be fine. That was my dad's response to pretty much everything. It'll be fine. Well, two days in, we had a flat tire right in the middle of nowhere in Mexico. And we were stuck in the middle of these, these avocado trees all around on this remote road in Mexico. And I remember feeling so angry at my dad for getting us stranded in the middle of Mexico. And I remember making a vow to myself. I said, when I'm an adult, I'm never going to drive around on crummy tires. And I was telling this story to my wife the other day, and she said, that's why you're such a freak about tires. I said, I'm not a freak about tires. And she said, oh, yes, you are. She's like, have you ever noticed that any time there's any weird rumbling or anything a little bit off with the tires, you're at discount tire like 30 minutes later? I guess they do know me by first name there. She's like, you replace them when they're not even bad. I'm like, yeah, well, when they're half-life, they're done. Half-life of a tire, they're done. It's time for new tires. And I started realizing, maybe I am a freak about tires. And, and here's what I know about every one of us in this room. If we were to talk for a few minutes, you've probably got some little idiosyncrasy about you, some little thing you do that comes from a moment when you were growing up, when you had to deal with some of the results of some decisions your parents made, and you said, hmm, when I'm an adult, I'm never going to do that. And yet, you find yourself today doing the very same thing you vowed you would never do. I'm never going to yell at my children that way. And then you find yourself yelling at your children and going, oh, I'm becoming my mother. Some of you, it's like, I'm never going to be that irresponsible with money. You know, when you're poor, you don't realize you're poor. You don't realize you're poor until after you're not poor. You know, you, you thought everybody put the cardboard in their shoes to keep the, you know, keep the holes from affecting you. But you realize maybe later on, you're like, man, we were just dirt poor. And maybe you realize it was because of your dad's decisions. Maybe it was his alcoholism. Maybe it was his, you know, just he didn't understand how money worked. Or maybe you look at your mom and how she was when she would get mad. And you're like, I'm never going to be that way. And we all pick up these things because we were all impacted. We, an imprint was left on us by decisions our parents made. And, and, and for many of us, it becomes a driving force in how we choose to live our lives and how we're going to lead our families. We say, I'm just never going to do that. And you get a vision for what you want to do. There, Pascal, Blaise Pascal, he said this. He said, deep within all of us, there is a God-shaped vacuum. He says, and this, this vacuum, here's the quote here. It says, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man or woman which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. And every one of us have an area in our lives where we're always feeling this kind of sucking. It's like, man, if I, I just need a little bit more of this, or if I just had a little bit more of that, everything would be okay. And, and usually it comes down to, to three things. All of your hopes and dreams, all of your basic needs come down to three things. And, and I've, I've laid it out in a triangle here. The first thing we all need is a sense of security. We need to know we're going to be safe. And we look, for our parent, look to our parents to give us that sense of security. This, the second thing, if you put that triangle up, guys, that we need is the sense of connection. A connection is just feeling validated, seen, heard, loved. And then we all need a sense of control or empowerment. We need to know we've got some decisions to make. Now, 
I'm going to go in really quick onto this triangle, and you're going to go, wait, stop. I need to know more about that. Uh, I wrote a whole book about it. It's available in the lobby. If, if you're like, wait, what was that triangle thing? I'm going to blow through this really quick, but it's available in the lobby for 10 bucks. If you can't afford it, just tell them it's on Joel, and you can take one. But they're in the back. But this triangle, I think, defines everything that we're made for. Because you think about it, in the Garden of Eden, we had this. We had a perfect security. I mean, it was a perfect garden. There was no sin. We had perfect connection with God so much that he walked with us in the, so that he walked with us in, in, in the cool of the day with Adam and Eve. And then we had a perfect sense of control and empowerment. He said, you got the run of the place. Do whatever you want. Just don't do one thing. Of course, what did we do? We humans, Adam and Eve, they, they did the one thing they weren't supposed to. And as soon as they did, they felt afraid and disconnected from God's love. So God's love is the source of the security, connection, and control that we need. But because of sin, we constantly feel a fear of not having those things. And what it looks like when we don't get those things, when we don't get the security we need, it feels like abandonment. And some of you, you are actually abandoned by a father or a mother. They just took off and you grew up without that, that father or mother. And there's a good chance that you feel this deep need for security. And sometimes the security looks like money. For some, for some of us, the reason we, we keep working and we still say, man, I just need a little bit more. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. Because money looks like security to you. For some, security looks like having all of you, everybody kind of play out the role that you have for them in your family. Like you want your kids to go off and go on to medical school or you want to, uh, whatever it is, you have dreams and hopes for them. That looks like security for you. For some, the, the, the sense is, is the connection that you need. And connection looks like when you don't get connection, it feels like rejection. And so the driving force is, I just don't ever want to be rejected. So what oftentimes people do is they just bend over backwards and keep saying yes to everything. And whenever anybody asks them to do a favor, oh yeah, we'll do it. And things pile up and resentment just builds. And you're like, how did I get in over my head again telling all these people to do this stuff? And I feel like people abuse me and I'm, I'm always doing things for other people and they never do anything for me. But you're afraid to say no because you're afraid of rejection. And it becomes a driving force is not being rejected. And for some, in my corner is control. My deepest fear is I do not want to be controlled, which is why I haven't had a traditional job in years, because those people tell you what to do. And I don't like that. And my great fear, the thing when I'm out of control is I'm afraid of being humiliated or feeling helpless. And we've all got one of these that we're sensitive to. And if we talk for a few minutes, I'm a, I'm a trained counselor. I could pull, probably pull it out of you. You've got something that based on what you didn't get growing up, it's been driving you. It's been that sucking sound, that God-shaped vacuum. What you're really looking for is God's love, but it shows up as a need for the security or the sense of connection or the sense of control. And we all have an area in our lives where we're super sensitive to that. And, and some of us, were just terrified of being abandoned, rejected, or humiliated. And, and the reason we have these conflicts within our family right now is because we're so afraid of losing that that we do whatever we can to make sure that we don't lose it. Now we're made to get these things. There's nothing wrong with you for wanting those things. You're made for them, but you're made to get them from God's love. The challenge we face is our first experience of love usually comes from our parents because as children, we're born helpless. You need them. But our parents have a problem and it's the same problem you and I have. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I had really great parents but on their best day, they were dirty, rotten sinners. They had a problem. Same problem I do. They fall short of the glory of God. So even on their best day, the love they gave me was far short of what I needed. And I felt that lack. And I know that's the same for you. Some of you, you grew up feeling like you were never enough for your father or your mother. And, and listen, when I say for your father, this, in, in, this refers to any parent. For maybe for you, it's your mother is the issue, right? So just fill in the blank there. Some, it's, some people I've talked to, it's their mother. Is their, they have mother challenges and others, it's father challenges. So whatever it is, whatever your parents were or weren't, bottom line is they had the exact same problem you and I do. They fell short of the glory of God. And we get our first ideas about who God is from the first God-like figures in our lives, which tend to be the people who raised us. But they're flawed, and they can't give us the perfect love. And we end up oftentimes projecting onto God feelings that we got from our parents. 
So, so maybe like think, think for a second about which word maybe describes your father or mother. I've got a list of words up here. Maybe they felt absent or distant. I've heard people say, my dad was there, but he just was absent. Like never got an emotional connection from him, didn't feel any sense of, of security from him. Um, he was just there kind of watching sports or watching TV. And, and, and if you felt your dad's absence, there's a good chance that in some way you've projected that feeling of absence onto God. Like, yeah, maybe he's up there somewhere, but he's not really here for me. In my case, my dad was so calm and passive that I kind of went to the other extreme, and I am not calm and passive. I'm uptight, anxious, and a control freak. And my greatest fear, if I'm honest about God, is that I'm going to find myself one day in over my head, and he's not going to bail me out. He's going to go, ah, he'll be fine down there. It'll all work out. I got that from the dad I love, but he just, that's the, was his nature, and so I felt that lack in my life. For some, maybe as your, your parents played favorites, you know, you weren't the athletic one, but your brother or sister was, and your dad or mom really loved the athletic one, so they just, every, all the favor was to the, to the athletic one. And you just, you felt this sense of resentment towards your parents because you're like, well, I'm not athletic, I'm artistic, or I'm good at math, but they don't value that. Maybe your, your parents were just harsh or self-serving. It was all about them, maybe a narcissistic parent. For some, it's a recklessness. You look and you go, man, the way they were with money was so reckless. And I'm, I'm, I don't want to be that way. And maybe you're afraid God is that way. And for some, it's just impossible to please. Maybe you had a parent that, man, you'd come home with five A's and one B, and they'd be like, why'd you get the B? You're like, man, I got five A's. We all have these issues based on that. And, and, and A.W. Tozer said this. He said, what comes to mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. How you see God is really what drives how you live your life. Because if you believe God is a loving God and he's for you and he's with you, you're going to live based on that. If you're worried that God is a God that he's never pleased, he's never happy, you might be driven by that all because of something you had, an experience you had with your parents. I've talked to men whose, whose dads have passed away years before and they're still trying to prove to their dad they're man enough. I've talked to men who have ruined their marriages because they're like, I'm going to prove that I'm man enough to get my dad's love. And what they ended up doing is they drive, their, they're, they're at work all the time trying to prove something and their family is suffering because of it. The good news is this. Your heavenly father is not your earthly father. Your heavenly father is perfect. And he came and he restored the relationship the, between God and man. And this idea of, of freeing your father, there's this ancient theme that before a person be can become all that they're supposed to be, before a hero can become all they're supposed to be, they have to at some point descend into the darkness and rescue their father. And we see this picture in the story of Jesus. Part of the reason he had to become fully man was because we had a dysfunctional family line that started with Adam. And there's a verse in Romans that talks about this, this family line that was, that was broken and messed up. And, and Paul says it this way. He says, if because of one man's trespass, if because of the sin of Adam and Eve, death reigned through that one man. So we were, we were the product of a curse from Adam. And you say, well, I didn't sin. Yeah, but you got started pretty early, I'm guessing, right? Uh, I did. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, leads to justification and life for all men. So here's the crux of this verse. It says, For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience, that was Jesus Christ who became fully man, the many will be made righteous. Jesus came and restored the perfect relationship between God and man. And now we have access to all the security, all the sense of connection, all the sense of empowerment we need through his love. But we've got to stop looking at what our parents weren't and start looking at what he is. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians. He says, um, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All that lack you felt of not having the security, connection, and control you needed, that's passed away. That was the old you. The new you has found all of that in the fullness of Christ. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And he will give life to your mortal body. And as you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, the security, connection, and control you're looking for, he's the one 
who will provide that for you. Stop looking at what you didn't get and start looking at who Jesus was. And it says here, it says, all this was from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sin, their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. This is where it gets really good. Not only did God set you free from sin and give you access to his perfect love, this is what it says now. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. A few years ago, I went to Israel and uh, I was visiting a friend and he works for the U.S. Embassy there and I needed to go somewhere and I was going to go take a bus and he's like, just take my car. And I was like, I don't know about driving in Israel. Like, is, am I going to be okay driving in Israel? And he said, you'll be fine. Nobody will pull you over. Nobody will mess with you. I'm like, really? He said, yeah, you've got, you've got embassy tags. I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, when you're in that car, you're on U.S. property and the police can't mess with you. My first thought was, <laughs> sweet. I can do whatever I want. And he's like, no. It's like Paul said, no, you don't, you don't use your liberty for an occasion under the flesh. You drive like a representative of another kingdom so that when people look and go, wait, whoa, what is that? And, and we as, as Christ's ambassadors, we're called to take this message of freedom. You've been given a mission. He set you free from your fear of not having security, not having connection, control, not having control. And it says this, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God didn't just set you free. He didn't just become the source of your security, your connection and control. He sent you on a mission and that mission involves reconciling yourself with, with, the, with your family and those around you and saying, look, God set me free and now it's time that our whole family be, become free. And listen, there's a lot riding on this. There's a lot riding on this. I believe many of the problems in our nation at their core are rooted in parent issues. There's a lot of people that are angry and hurt and they're looking for somebody to save them. And the good news is Christ came and he saved us and now he sent you on the mission. And there's this ancient theme that you see throughout history and stories and fables and tales and you even see it in the Bible that before a person can achieve their full destiny and become all that God has for them, they have to descend into the darkness, face off with the things they don't want to face off with. Carl Jung said it this way, the thing you need the most will be found where you least want to look. Sometimes you have to descend in the darkness and go and rescue the very people. You can't rescue them, but you can share the message that they've been rescued. You can share with the very people who hurt you, who damaged you, who you feel like set you at a disadvantage. You can go and say, hey, we're set free from the power of sin and death. I mean, you see this in stories. You see it through all these stories, like Pinocchio. You know, before Pinocchio could become a real boy, he had to go rescue Geppetto from the belly of Monstro the whale. You see in, in, in modern stories like Star Wars, before Luke could become the Jedi master, he had to face off with his father and he, and he knew, I, I know there's still good in him. And everybody's like, you're insane. The guy's nuts. And he ends up rescuing Darth Vader from the clutches of the dark side. You see with Jen Erso in the, in the new Star Wars, she had to go and she had to clear her father's name and then save the galaxy. It's this theme that's within us that we are sent on a mission, but to get to the fullness of all God has for you, sometimes you have to descend into the darkness and go back and pull out the very people who did the worst harm to you. And oftentimes, that's the people we trusted the most, those people who raised us, there's this philosopher named Albert Camus. I don't recommend his stuff, but he has this brilliant quote. He says, the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so radically free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. Sometimes in this unfree world that's saying, man, you should hold it against your parents, what they did, they messed you up. You have to say, no, no, man, I'm walking in freedom and I'm a warrior of that freedom. I'm gonna go and tell the captives that are still in the darkness, my family, my kids, maybe some of you, you, you're okay with your parents or they've passed away, but you know your family is in disarray right now. And you've been called to be the person who brings that reconciliation. And it's gonna be founded on the fact that Christ has set us free from the power of sin and death. We have to step into that role. You have to be the ones 
that feel the call the mission to bring reconciliation you know Christ throughout the Bible he uses family language when he's talking about reconciling the world to himself we are his family and he wants you to be the one that breaks the cycle of dysfunction in your family you have to be the one that says it stops here we're gonna take things to the next level and a lot of what we have to do is we have to you know Christian the Christian walk sometimes is a lot of learning about God but a lot of it is unlearning what isn't God and we've had some imprints on us that aren't God and we haven't recognized that that's not who God is that's been a lie when you step out and, and, and do this something powerful happens in Hebrews 11 there's a strange verse at Hebrews 11 there's a, a whole list of heroes who walked by faith Paul says this guy did this by faith and this guy did this by faith and this guy did this by faith and then he ends with saying this now all these people they were commended for their faith but none of them received what had been promised because God had something bigger planned for us so that only together with us that's you and me and everybody in this room would they be made perfect there's something powerful about you taking on the mission of saying you know what I'm gonna be the minister of reconciliation no matter how bad they hurt me no matter what they did to me I'm gonna be the one that descends into the darkness and I'm gonna emerge and our family is gonna be changed the destiny is going to be changed and even if your family has passed away you can make the choices you can make the decisions to walk in the freedom that Christ has for you and your family and there is reconciliation I've seen God do miracles in families that have been so divided he can bring them together but it starts by walking in freedom and over the next few weeks I'm gonna be talking about three specific steps that we all have to take to go on that mission that God has called us to do we have to face the things that our parents were face the things they weren't face the things we were face the things we weren't and we have to step up and rise up because no no eye has seen no ear has heard no mind has perceived what God has in store for those who put their trust in him he has a purpose for your family he has a purpose for you and no matter how messed up things may be right now there may be a war going on for your family trust me on this the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living in you he is gonna give you the power you need to take the steps and you're gonna see reconciliation you're gonna see your family rescued and you're gonna take your family to a level that you never could have dreamed that's my prayer for you over the next few weeks bring come back next week and bring your friends and we're gonna talk more about this let me pray for you father we thank you so much that you set us free from the power of sin and death if anyone is in Christ they are a new creation so I thank you, Lord, that over the next few weeks, Lord, you're going to be, man, you're going to be changing the course of history, family histories and destinies through your power that is at work within us. Thank you for this. In your name, amen. Amen. Would you all stand as we continue in our worship?
I would love to pray for you this morning. We say it each week and we mean it. The mission field begins as soon as you guys hit those doors. God bless. We'll see you next week.